that he made, that he tweeted on uh, December 10th. Uh, and this is part of the tweet. He says, there's no collusion, so now the Dems go to a simple private transaction, wrongly call it a campaign contribution, which it was not. But then in parentheses, the president writes, but even if it was, it is only a civil case like Obama's. Do you agree with what the president wrote? Uh, I do largely, yes, because remember, it's not unlawful for him to have purchased silence or purchased the right to a story or any kind of agreement to limit her ability to speak about something. That's lawful. The question is whether or not the monies that were paid were for campaign purposes and reported. People tend to hear the story and think, well, if he's buying her silence, that must be the crime. But that really isn't it. Right. The crime is the illegal campaign contribution. Right. right? But right. And that usually is not criminal. Right. But you can't. But the president is trying to compare this, which is illegal, to the campaign violations that the Obama campaign had back in 2008, which were for missing filings and incorrect paperwork that was filed. I don't. You can, you, you can compare the two. You think they're apples and apples, the way the president is tweeting? It's hard to say. I mean, there's a, a huge shade of gray between one campaign violation and another. I don't know if we can say, well, this one at level X is okay, but the one at level Y is worse, so it shouldn't be okay. I mean, a violation's a violation. Right, but missing a filing deadline is not paying off a porn star and a Playboy model with monies that are now being, according to the Southern District, which are illegal. They're illegal campaign contributions. President Obama and his campaign, they were not found guilty of having done anything illegal. Well, and I don't know yet, and most people haven't commented whether or not the president has done anything illegal either. No, Cohen has. I'm saying Cohen. No. Yeah, yeah. I was talking about Trump as far as his campaign violation. I mean, sure, on its surface, it does sound worse, but it doesn't mean that it is worse. You know, we're often charged by the emotion behind the Stormy Daniels story when it's, again, just paying off somebody to be silent about something that a businessman didn't want public. Yeah, no, I, I think that most of the American people who are following this story understand that it's not about the sex and it's not about the titillation of a porn star or a Playboy know model. I, no, I, well, I mean, I think that people are able to, are able to distinguish between something which is which has to do with the personals, uh, the president's or the candidate's personal mm -hmm. interactions with somebody and what the Southern District and the Mueller investigation is charging here, which is that this was an illegal... If, he had, if Michael Cohen hadn't created a shell company to you know, pay these women off um, at the time that it happened, and a lot of it has to do with timing, right, which right. is before the election, then we wouldn't be talking about this. It right, would just exactly. be something that, you know, hey, the president, um, you know, uh, has a relationship with these two other women, or the candidate has a relationship with these two other women, but now we're talking about something different. He's been found guilty of that. Cohen. Yeah, Cohen. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know that you can compare missing a filing deadline or submitting an application that was filled out incorrectly, which is what the, uh, what the Federal Commission, uh, Elections Commission found with President Obama's campaign, to this. I just think that the president is trying, I think what it is easy to do is the president is able to, for those people who support him, uh, to draw, to, to b b muddy the waters a little by saying he's being accused of exactly the same thing President Obama was being accused of, which is simply not true. Oh, sure. Of course. It's a, it's a big spin. I, I understand that. Yeah. But so, same with what Cohen's doing. I mean, it's all, everybody's spinning it to their advantage right now. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so I guess as we await this, you know, your, your sense is that he's not going to uh, serve any time. And I guess that will be really interesting because there's some people who are saying that he actually might serve a little time, that the the Southern District's um, recommendation is so strong that uh, the judge might be forced to at least give him a little bit of time. But yeah, I, I, and I do find also, it interesting. Because everybody's watching this so closely, they might not want to just have him walk out those doors. Right. Do you, do you know this judge who's going to decide this? No, not yeah. at all. Yeah, because I, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes I guess it has to do with the judge's sensibilities as well. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a hard call because, like, you know, all judges have a lot of eyes on them, and this one has probably more than anybody in, in much of our history. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Brad Micklin, thank you so much for chatting with us. Really interesting discussion. I appreciate your insights. Thank you for having me, sir. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, have a good day. All right, so we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, spinning doorway there. As soon as we get some movement then from Mr. Cohen or we understand exactly what he has said or what the judges said, we will bring it to you live. Stick around.
Officials have now declared yesterday's deadly shooting in Strasbourg, France, a terror attack. A manhunt for the gunman is still ongoing after the shooter opened fire near a famous Christmas market in the city. Two people have been killed and a third victim is brain dead. Oksana Saberi is in Strasbourg, where police say the suspect may have fled to Germany. A top French counterterrorism official says witnesses heard the gunman yell, Allahu Akbar, or God is great, when he opened fire here at the Christmas market last night. And the mayor of Strasbourg says it was a terror attack. The streets here are quieter than usual today as the search for the suspect continues. Streets covered with Christmas lights were filled with screams as the lone gunman sprayed shots near a Christmas market. People caught in the chaos ran for cover, like Isam Ferris. I heard several shots and I thought maybe it's firecrackers, he said. But then I saw a lot of people running, scared, crying kids and all. So I ran away and hid in a restaurant. Police have named the shooter as Strasbourg-born Sharif Shakat. According to a U.S. law enforcement official, Shakat is believed to have had an automatic rifle and a knife. He was known to French authorities, previously convicted of assault and theft, and spent time in jail. He's also on a terror watch list for possible extremist ties. Police raided his apartment on the morning of the attack on unrelated charges, but he wasn't there. After the shooting at the market, police chased the gunman through the streets, exchanging fire. He was injured, but got away. This morning, more than 350 security forces are searching for the man who added the self-promoted capital of Christmas to the list of cities hit by terror. Police have detained several people for questioning. No terror group has claimed responsibility for the attack so far. Vlad and Anne-Marie. Roxana, thank you. All right, we're keeping an eye on that courtroom in Lower Manhattan, U.S. District Courthouse. That's where we find Paula Reed. She is going to update us on what we can expect as we know that Mr. Cohen, Michael Cohen, the president's former attorney, his sentencing hearing is happening right now. So, uh, Paula, just for uh, purposes of setting this up for our viewers, as we wait for Mr. Cohen to emerge from that courtroom, explain how we got here. Well, back in August, Michael Cohen entered a cooperation deal with federal prosecutors. I mean, this is a man who said that he would take a bullet for President Trump. He was his longtime fixer and personal attorney. But when it became clear that federal prosecutors had enough to charge him with several crimes, including campaign finance violations, tax fraud, bank fraud, Cohen flipped. He decided that he would cooperate with uh, federal prosecutors in exchange for having some of those charges dropped. Now, recently, just a couple of weeks ago, he surprised everyone by entering another plea deal with special counsel Robert Mueller. In that case, he pleaded guilty to lying to Congress, but agreed to cooperate with that investigation. And today he is going to be sentenced for both of these cases. Now, there's sort of a tale of two Michael Cohens here. His lawyers describe him as a good man, a man who is reformed, who made mistakes when he represented President Trump, but someone who has, quote, suffered enough and should be spared jail time. But federal prosecutors describe him as someone who tried to undermine democracy for his own profit, and they are seeking substantial jail time. Now, the special counsel has not really weighed in on how much jail time they think he should get. They're kind of deferring to these prosecutors in New York who do want to see him put away for a while. You know, Paula, I know you've been speaking to Michael Cohen's lawyers. What have they told you? I've spoken to some folks who are familiar with what we should expect today in the court. We expect that Cohen will give a statement uh, in his own defense and that he will start out by apologizing uh, first to his family, including his father, who is a Holocaust survivor, and he will also apologize to the American people for any participation that he had in crimes that occurred during or before the election. We also expect that he will denounce President Trump and apologize once again to the American people for not uh, sharing what he knew about crimes that were allegedly taking place during the election. It will be very interesting to see just how he frames his relationship with the president and uh, how he characterizes the president. Now, of course, he has shared um, some very damaging information with the, both federal prosecutors and the special counsel. He has provided really the most direct evidence, the most direct link uh, between the president and criminal conduct. 
Uh, you know, Paula, you described sort of the tale of two cities when it comes to Mr. Cohen and this sentencing hearing. Uh, on one hand, you've got the special counsel, Robert Mueller's team, uh, saying that uh, he contributed what they call, quote, significant efforts, that he told the truth when it came to them. On the other hand, you've got the Southern District saying he undermined democracy. So how does a judge judge those two sort of uh, tales? I think you're going to see the judge deferring to the federal prosecutors from New York because they're the ones who have argued that he should have a substantial sentence. And their issue with Cohen is that they're like, look, you said you were going to cooperate. That's an all or nothing prospect. But you didn't fully cooperate. They argue that they do not believe that he fully shared everything he knows about crimes that may have been committed. And that is why they are not asking for leniency. And while Cohen's attorneys say he, he shouldn't have any jail time or if he does, it should be suspended while he continues to cooperate. The fact is, Vlad, I think the judge is probably going to defer to those federal prosecutors. I do expect that Cohen will get a jail sentence, but the big question right now is just how long that sentence will be. Mm. And finally, Paul, I know, as we said, you've been in contact with Cohen's legal team. Um, Mr. Cohen, I believe, is going to get a moment where he will be able to address the court. Do we think, and I'm asking to speculate here, but I know you've been uh, keeping tabs on his legal team, that he will talk a little bit more about this quote that was in the filing that he acted in coordination with and at the direction of Mr. Trump. It's possible. He may not want to get too into the kind of evidence he's shared. I think you're going to be looking at more broad strokes, characterization of himself, again, as a good man, as a family man, as someone who is now all about country and family and wants to continue to cooperate with the government and then characterizing the president um, in less positive terms, again, denouncing the president, denouncing his behavior and his association with the president. I don't know, though, that he's actually going to get in to the details of the kind of evidence that he shared with federal prosecutors. All right, Paula, we know you're going to be there for the next couple of hours. We'll be talking to you throughout the course of the day. Thank you so much. Turning now to Miami, where, as we saw earlier, we got an update on that mysterious illness that hit several members of the staff at the U.S. Embassy in Cuba. CBS News correspondent and radio executive editor Steve Dorsey is with us now from Miami. He's been covering this story from the very beginning. Steve, uh, what did the doctors conclude? Well, Vlad, these were the first doctors to evaluate on the front lines these dozens of Americans who started complaining about these unusual sounds and pressure changes and strange symptoms beginning in late 2016. Now they're confirming uh, many of these symptoms, including everything from dizziness to disorientation, irritability, ear pain, and they're connecting this this trauma to the inner ear with symptoms that appear to be consistent with traumatic brain injury, like concussions. Hmm. You, know, you know, Steve, uh, and we listened to those doctors deliver a pretty comprehensive report on the symptoms and the patients that they treated, but we didn't seem to me, and I'm no doctor, it didn't seem to me that we got any closer understanding what exactly yeah. triggered uh, those illnesses or if it was deliberate, if it was man-made, if it was natural, we really didn't get a sense of that. Yeah, Vlad, that is a big concern, especially among the, the community of victims that has been demanding, looking for answers on who or what caused these attacks, according to the State Department, that began in 2016, more than two years ago. The doctors here told reporters they have no idea what caused these attacks, and they don't know if they were intentional, deliberative, or something from the natural environment. They do speculate that they can't rule out things like directed energy. Those could be anything from acoustic energy, uh, electromagnetic pulses, ultrasound, lasers, microwaves. You've got a lot to consider here, and the doctors here just aren't willing to rule anything out. And Steve, before we let you go, um, I know you covered a very similar instance of staff at a U.S. embassy in China who suffered similar symptoms. Um, is there, I mean, I know these doctors wouldn't obviously talk about any kind of direct linkage, but maybe take our audience through who might be scratching their heads and saying to themselves, you know, I remember hearing something about this, but it was in China. Yeah, that's a ripple in this whole story stemming from Cuba. Now, of course, the State Department confirming one person at its post in China in Guangzhou was confirmed to have injuries similar to what those folks in, in Cuba now back home in the U.S. seeking treatment uh, elsewhere in 
at the University of Pennsylvania and throughout the United States uh, have been experiencing. A number of other people have been evacuated from China complaining of similar symptoms. So it's raising concerns, especially for a lawyer that we talked to yesterday, representing a group of these uh, victims who says victims in Cuba are especially concerned about whether this is happening across the world, of course, in places like China, but how long it's also been going on. He suspects it could be happening. It could have been going on for decades. Yeah. And, and finally, Steve, you know, I, I wonder what the State Department is doing about this. Secretary Pompeo, he's been in the news of late talking about things that are, are equally important, including the death of Jamal Khashoggi, our stance towards Iran, what's happening in Yemen. But this, I think for a lot of people here back home, we should remember that embassy staff are just regular folks who go about doing a job. Uh, in many instances, they bring their entire families there. In some cases, it, they get a great posting like Paris or Rome. But more often than not, the postings are not right. incredibly luxurious. Um, and, you know, if you're in one of those situations, if you're part of a diplomatic staff in a country, you kind of want to know that the U.S. State Department's got your back on this or at least is taking precautions. Are we hearing anything that has changed or that they are recommending uh, embassy folks do differently? Well, you know, the U.S. won't uh, reveal the security measures it's taking in Cuba and around the world, uh, but they have reduced, as we've reported before, that, that crew at the embassy from something like 50 employees to now about 18 or less, a skeleton crew, really. That's caused a lot of hardships for Cubans looking for American visas. That's caused uh, limitations in how much emergency consular activities can go on in Havana. And this is something that the State Department says it's taking seriously. They're defending their approach to this, even though they've been accused of, uh, of, of a lack of transparency. They say the safety and well-being of their diplomats across the world is their first priority. All right, CBS News correspondent Steve Dorsey, thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Thank, thanks, Vlad. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, a lot more news to cover. We're keeping an eye on that courthouse here in Lower Manhattan, where we expect uh, in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we will hear exactly what happened at Michael Cohen, the president's former attorney, sentencing hearing. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Colorado police have released new video of the missing mother last seen on Thanksgiving Day. Surveillance video from a Safeway grocery store in Woodland Park, Colorado, shows the last time 29-year-old Kelsey Barrett was seen while shopping with her one-year-old daughter. She was reported missing 10 days later. On November 25th, her cell phone pinged near Gooding, Idaho. That's nearly 800 miles away. That same day, two text messages were sent from her phone. Police say they're treating the investigation as a missing persons case. The search is intensifying for three people missing in an abandoned coal mine in West Virginia. They've been in the mine since Saturday. A fourth person came out Monday night and is working with authorities to help find the others. Chip Reed is near the mine in Whitesville, West Virginia. The search for the missing people will continue today. Yesterday, they pumped fresh air into the mine and standing water out of the mine, but they fear that time could be quickly running out. Family and friends on Tuesday waited anxiously for updates about 25-year-old Kayla Williams, 31-year-old Erica Treadway, and 21-year-old Cody Beverly. Investigators believe the missing trio is inside an inactive mine in the heart of West Virginia's coal country. I just didn't know what to think. I couldn't believe she went in there. Tyler Treadway is Erica's brother. I mean, it's just mind-boggling, you know. You don't know what the conditions are. You could hit a bad pocket of the air without even knowing it. I mean, it's just dangerous. Treadway, Beverly. Beverly Williams and a fourth person, 43-year-old Eddie Williams, were reported missing late Saturday. On Sunday, investigators discovered the group's ATV near the entrance of Rock House Powhatan Mine and launched a rescue team. The following night, Eddie Williams came out of the mine safely on his own and told investigators the location of the three remaining people inside. Governor Jim Justice ordered additional resources, including the National Guard, to help with the search. Usually these things end up not very good, and so we still got some real heavy lifting to get to a good outcome here. The Rock House Powhatan mine has been inactive for two years. Trespassers often explore closed mines in this poverty-stricken state for abandoned materials, including copper wiring. This is just a dangerous place to be, and no one should go and, you know, plea. People just, if you're curious or you have other reasons you think going to the mine, just don't do it. The company that owns the mine is cooperating in the search, and I'll tell you, the dangers of coal mines are very well known in this area. Just down the road a bit is a memorial to the 29 coal miners who died in the Upper Big Branch mine disaster eight years ago. Vlad and Anne Marie. Chip, thank you so much. All right, now to this. An earthquake jolted people in Tennessee, yeah, Tennessee, and parts of Georgia this morning. The 4.4 magnitude quake happened just after 4 a.m. Its center was about seven miles northeast of the town of Decatur, Tennessee, but people felt their homes shake as far as Atlanta. That's one way to wake up. Just 13, <laughs> Scary way to yeah, wake up. Yeah, really. Just 13 minutes later, a 3.3 magnitude aftershock took place. So far, there's been no reports of injuries, though. Coming up in just a few moments, President Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, will soon find out if he's headed to jail. Our Paula Reed is standing by in New York for the sentencing. Plus, the president is standing firm on his promise to deliver border security, even if it means shutting down the government. We'll have more on his tense Oval Office meeting with top Democrats and if a compromise can be reached. And British Prime Minister Theresa May is facing a vote on her future over her Brexit deal. Members of her own party will decide if she will be out of a job. We'll keep you up to speed on that. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on.
Hi everyone, I'm Vladimir Jutte. We are taking a live look right now outside of the federal courthouse in New York City, Lower Manhattan, where we expect uh, in just a few moments, Michael Cohen will have gone through his sentencing hearing and we will know more about what was said in that hearing. Our Paula Reed is there on the ground. We're gonna keep an eye on that screen for you. But meanwhile, while we do, Anne-Marie Green will join me in just a moment. But as we've been reporting, President Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is facing a judge at this very moment. Here's what he did. He pleaded guilty to tax evasion, making illegal hush money payments on Mr. Trump's behalf during the 2016 campaign, and then he lied about it to Congress. Cohen could be sentenced to four years or so in prison. His lawyers have asked for leniency, saying some of Cohen's crimes were motivated by what they refer to as overenthusiasm for President Trump. So we're awaiting, this is tape playback of uh, about an hour ago when Mr. Cohen arrived at the courthouse with his family. Uh, again, we expect that this will happen in the next uh, few moments or so. Obviously, when it does, we will uh, bring it to you live. We'll explain to you what's going down. Our Paula Reed is there. We're going to talk to her. We'll talk to other lawyers. You'll have a good sense of what exactly happened and what it means going forward for the Trump presidency and the Mueller investigation. Meanwhile, President Trump startled some lawmakers when he invited the top two Democrats in Congress to the Oval Office yesterday and then told them that he would shut down the government if he doesn't get funding for his promised border security. The president allowed cameras to capture a 17-minute argument, discussion, argument, however you want to phrase it, between Senator Chuck Schumer and Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi, who said they would not give President Trump the funding that he desires. In a tweet earlier today, President Trump said, quote, the Democrats and President Obama gave Iran $150 billion and got nothing, but they can't give $5 billion for national security and a wall. The president, of course, is referring to the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, which released money that had been frozen by economic sanctions. It was not given to Iran. Weijia Jiang has more on yesterday's meeting. But you have walls, Chuck, it's effective. We, where you don't have Wait walls, it is not effective. Yeah. Let's call a halt to this. Public bickering over President Trump's proposed border wall ended with a defiant declaration in the Oval Office. I am proud to shut down the government for border security, Chuck. So I will take the mantle. I will be the one to shut it down. I'm not the president made board. clear to we'll Democratic leaders Chuck Schumer and Nancy Let's Pelosi he is not budging on his mission tending bill. Mr. But they are urging him to support legislation that offers $1.3 billion for fencing and other security measures. The experts say you can do border security without a wall, which is wasteful and doesn't solve the problem. It, it totally solves but the I problem. Want to take this. I, and it's very important. This is spiraled downward. After the showdown, President Trump stood by his offer to own a partial government shutdown and downplayed the wild exchange. Well, believe it or not, I think it was a very friendly meeting. The Democrats had a different take. This Trump shutdown, this temper tantrum that he seems to throw, will not get him his wall, and it'll hurt a lot of people. In a private meeting back on Capitol Hill, Pelosi told colleagues, it goes to show you, you get into a tinkle contest with a skunk, you get tinkle all over you. And it's like a manhood thing for him, as if manhood could ever be associated with him, this wall thing. If Congress does not make a deal by December 21st, about a fourth of the government would close. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Magic things happen at Christmas, and that's what I'm counting on. All right, so Weijia Jiang joins us now from the White House. Weijia, it's in your story uh, that the president called this meeting friendly. It didn't look friendly, but it looked spirited. Yeah, everybody at has they, their own definition hey, of look, what that is. At least they were talking. But look, we have a deadline. It's December 21st. So how does this set up negotiations leading to that deadline? Yeah, well, friendly is just a word. It's just an adjective, and you can use anything you want to describe this, and none of that really matters, because what matters now is action and whether a compromise can be made. Now, Schumer and Pelosi have offered two alternative plans to President Trump to keep the government open with short-term funding. Of course, he's probably not going to get that entire uh, $5 billion that he wants to build his wall. And apparently Pelosi said that after the meeting, President Trump called her up and they talked about ways forward, but he did not respond to these two very specific uh, possibilities on the table. So we don't know uh, what he's willing to do. And that's what matters here. Who is willing to give what? And 
it's not a lot of time, but uh, as we heard, everyone seems to be a little bit hopeful, um, but this certainly was quite a way to set up negotiations. Um, that being said, though, it's not out of the ordinary for President Trump to behave this way and, and really be tough when it comes to deal making. The difference is we got to see it and we never get to see the sausage being made. And this was why it was so remarkable um, to have access. And it's something that the president welcomed. He wanted the cameras in there. He allowed it. And I think, you know, he said as much. He said it's called transparency. Why not let the American people see how this is done? And there's a variety of reasons that, you know, typically we don't get to see that. Um, but this now really makes it a, an open window for where. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Jeff Glor at CBS News headquarters in New York. Good afternoon. Michael Cohen, President Trump's former personal lawyer, has just been sentenced to three years in federal prison. He pleaded guilty to nine counts of tax evasion, lying to Congress and a financial institution, and perhaps most notably to campaign finance violations related to hush money payments made to an adult film actress and Playboy Playmate during the 2016 campaign. Mr. Cohen says that the president directed him, wasn't the president at the time, directed him to make those payments. In addressing the judge, the Cohen said, uh, quote, weakness was a blind loyalty to Donald Trump and that he felt it was his duty to cover up the president's, quote, dirty deeds. Tearing up, Cohen apologized inside the courtroom, saying, quote, you deserve to know the truth, and lying to you was unjust. Paula Reed is at the federal courthouse in Manhattan. Uh, Paula, this is video we're looking at there of Michael Cohen walking to the courtroom earlier uh, with his family. Tell us about this sentence. Well, Cohen's lawyers were hoping that their client would be spared any jail time. They tried to paint him as a good man, a man who made mistakes when he represented Mr. Trump, but who has since been reformed and cooperated with the government. But federal prosecutors believe that he is someone who tried to undermine democracy for his own profit, and they were asking the judge for a substantial sentence. Now, he faced anywhere from four to five years, so this three-year sentence, this is a victory for the Justice Department in this case. Now, the special counsel uh, says that Cohen has cooperated with them, that he has been useful to them in their investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 campaign, but that was not enough to get him really any leniency here. So at the end of the day, even though he has cooperated against the president of the United States, he really doesn't have a lot to show for that cooperation with the sentence. Yeah, so, so Paul, explain this for us, because Cohen has sort of said that he fully flipped and has sort of gone entirely the other way, mm -hmm. but, but there's not a long-term cooperation agreement in place right? That's right, and that's a big discrepancy. Cohen's attorneys say he is fully cooperated, but federal prosecutors say he is not fully cooperated. They say they do not believe that he has shared everything he knows about crimes that were committed, and that's why they did not seek leniency in this case. That's part of why they were asking the judge for a substantial sentence. And here the judge, in laying out an explanation for this sentence, said, look, these are crimes that deserve a substantial punishment, and just because you cooperated with the special counsel doesn't mean you should be absolved of responsibility for these many crimes. Okay, so again, repeating the breaking news at this hour, Michael Cohen has been sentenced to three years in prison in Manhattan uh, for his crimes. Paula, explain to us then why Michael Cohen, if, if you're Michael Cohen's legal team or you're Michael Cohen, why you wouldn't then just go one way or the other completely and either hope for a presidential pardon or, or fully cooperate long term? Well, let's go back to August. Uh, that's when Cohen decided, remember this is a man he, who said he would take a bullet for the president, but back in August he decided that suddenly he would start cooperating with federal prosecutors. But that was the same time when it became clear. Federal prosecutors had enough evidence to charge him with several crimes ranging from tax fraud, bank fraud, campaign finance violations. He says that he agreed to cooperate in the interest of his country and his family, but really this was the only way that he was going to get his sentence reduced. There was always the chance of a presidential pardon, but he 
says both financially and for his family, he did not want to fight this through a trial and possibly a conviction and wait for that pardon. But again, he says he did not want to fully cooperate because of his family. He didn't want to enter into a long-term deal because of his family. But it's not exactly clear uh, if that explanation really pans out. Ultimately, federal prosecutors say they believe that he still has knowledge of potential crimes that he has not shared with them. Okay. Uh, Paula Reed, stand by. Uh, I want to go to Ouija Chang, who is at the White House right now. And uh, Ouija, uh, Jeff, I lost you for one second, but I can tell you we are anxiously waiting for reaction from President Trump or the White House. And we're certainly expecting something because he has been so vocal in the days leading up to today, working to set the stage for what we saw unfold in that Manhattan courtroom as simply a platform for Michael Cohen to continue lying to save himself and to get lesser time uh, behind bars. He has worked to distance himself also from Michael Cohen and for the crimes that Cohen will now serve serve time for, specifically when it comes to those hush money payments for the two women who are accusing the president of having affairs with them. On Friday, when the Southern District filed sentencing memos as guidance for what was going to happen to today, the president said in, in the third person, totally clears the president. But in fact, it did the opposite. It implicated him because prosecutors drew a direct line between Cohen and then candidate Trump, saying uh, that Cohen acted um, in coordination and at the direction of individual one, which we now know, of course, is Donald J. Trump. And so what this means for President Trump is very critical, um, even though he has tried to paint himself as a victim. And, and he called this a very simple transaction and said, even if this was a campaign finance violation, it's not my fault. It's because I had a bad lawyer. It's because Cohen didn't tell me and I should not um, be, uh, I should not serve any time for this because I didn't do anything wrong. So that's something we are closely watching for uh, because this, again, is such a close tie between the president and now what Cohen is serving time for, Jeff. Okay, Weecha, thank you very much. Uh, once again, Michael Cohen gets just gets just now three years in prison. Back to Paula Reed down at the courthouse. And, and so, Paula Reed, talk about the two different paths then as well because we're, we're talking about the Southern District, uh, prosecutors in the Southern District of New York, but then also the special counsel. That's right. He has two different cases. One is with federal prosecutors here in New York. He entered a plea deal with them back in August. But then he surprised everyone a couple weeks ago when he entered another plea deal, agreeing to cooperate with the special counsel investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 campaign. And it was interesting, both of those cases uh, brought back different reviews in terms of his cooperation. The special counsel says he provided useful, credible information to them in their investigation. But the federal prosecutors say they don't believe he was fully cooperative. They think he is still withholding some information, again, about these possible campaign finance violations. Now, as Ouija mentioned, last night the president came out and he said, Cohen was my personal lawyer. He should know the campaign finance laws. And once again, the president denies that this hush money paid to his mistresses, that that was in any way a campaign finance violation. He says that was a personal payment. But because this has nothing to do with Russia, all of the campaign finance stuff, that is being handled by those federal prosecutors here in New York. It is separate and apart from the special counsel investigation. But both federal prosecutors and the special counsel both found a useful witness uh, in Mr. Cohen. Okay, uh, Paula Reed outside the uh, courthouse there in New York City for us in, um, in Lower Manhattan uh, this morning. Paula, appreciate all of your reporting on this story. And of course, we will uh, be talking to you again throughout the afternoon. Uh, so to repeat, Michael Cohen, President Trump's former lawyer, has just been sentenced to three years in federal prison for crimes that included payments to uh, Mr. Trump's alleged mistresses. Much more on all of this story uh, on your local news on this CBS station, on our 24-hour streaming service, CBSN, and then we'll have a full wrap-up, of course, on the CBS Evening News tonight. Until then, I'm Jeff Glor, CBS News in New York. For news 24 hours a day, go to cbsnews.com. All right, we will pick it up from here. You just heard Jeff Glor, the anchor of the CBS Evening News, with the breaking news that Michael Cohen, the president's former fixer, lawyer, has just been sentenced to three years in prison for his role in a hush money scandal that, of course, 
has direct ties to the Trump presidency and to President Trump himself, implicating him in a scheme to buy the silence of two women who said that they had affairs with then-candidate Trump, that is, porn star Stormy Daniels and Playboy model Karen McDougal. The sentencing happened right there in Lower Manhattan at the federal courthouse there. And let's just take a step back and realize what a big deal this is. This is a stunning fall for Mr. Cohen, who was a ardent and vocal supporter of candidate Trump and ultimately President Trump. This uh, gentleman made the rounds on cable news uh, often uh, to speak in defense of President Trump. They will, uh, many viewers will recall, that that is what uh, happened earlier this morning when Mr. Cohen and his family arrived here um, in uh, the federal courthouse. So let's uh, go to Paula Reed, who is standing by at the courthouse there. Uh, Paula, as I was uh, just taking in the breaking news here that Mr. Cohen has been sentenced to three years in prison, um, I was sort of remarking at what a fall, what a stunning and startling fall for Mr. Cohen, who uh, once hoped to work at the side of President Trump in the White House, saying at one point that he would take a bullet for Donald J. Trump, and now sentenced to three years in jail. That's right, we sort of saw this coming in August when Cohen decided to flip on the president. That was around the same time that it became clear the Justice Department would be able to charge Cohen with tax fraud, bank fraud, campaign finance violations, and eventually he was also charged with lying to Congress. It became clear that he had to cooperate in an effort to keep himself out of prison, potentially for over a decade. We knew it was likely he would be sentenced uh, to some time in jail, but three years is a considerable sentence here. He faced a max of like four to five years in prison. So the fact that his lawyers were arguing for no jail time and he got three years of jail time plus three years of supervised release, that's a, that's a significant victory for the Justice Department in this case. Uh, all right, Weija Jang is also standing by. Paula, stand by. Let me go to Weija and get her reaction from uh, the White House. Uh, Weija, as you know, uh, the president uh, has called Michael Cohen a weak person who was giving information to prosecutors in an effort to obtain some leniency uh, for the crimes that he has just been sentenced for. I know it's very early. It just happened moments ago. But what has the White House been saying other than the president's tweets up until this moment? Actually, Vlad, it's very rare for the White House to comment on these matters, on the special counsel investigation, on what Michael Cohen has been charged with. So it's really telling that on Friday, Sarah Sanders issued an official statement from the White House that essentially called Michael Cohen a liar, that said uh, the sentencing memo that the Southern District filed ahead of today showed us nothing except for what uh, we already knew, which was that Cohen is not one to be trusted. And President Trump himself has been very vocal leading up to today, and you're right. He has painted Cohen over and over again as someone who cannot be trusted, who has no credibility, using his own actions and words against him, since we know that one of the things he pleaded guilty to was lying. And so President Trump tried to paint the stage for the courtroom today, even days before we heard from Cohen, uh, tried to get less time behind bars. And the president said, look, Cohen is only lying continuously to try to save himself and to have to serve less time. And so even though the president has not weighed in yet, the White House has not weighed in yet, we certainly expect that to happen again uh, because President Trump has been so loud about his former attorney and fixer. And President Trump has also tried to distance himself from whatever was going to happen today, uh, from specifically those two hush money payments to the women accusing uh, then candidate Trump of having affairs. And he has said that, you know, even though the, the, the Southern District filed a memo that specifically drew a line between Trump and Cohen, saying that Cohen acted in coordination with and at the direction of individual one, who we know is Donald J. Trump, the president said it totally clears him of any wrongdoing. And even if it was a campaign finance violation, that that it's not his fault, that it's because he had a bad lawyer and Cohen should have known that it was such a violation, when in his mind, the 
the president claims it was just a very simple transaction and his personal attorneys have said it would have happened anyway because it would have been to protect uh, Trump's reputation and not necessarily to impact the outcome of the election. Um, and so what we are closely watching here is the motive that will ultimately come out, perhaps, um, and whether or not it was to sway the election. Uh, that is important here as we continue to monitor how prosecutors are now moving closer to potentially charging uh, the president with these crimes and using Michael Cohen to do that as a bridge. Um, Paula, as Ouija points out, the president has suggested that Mr. Cohen is lying to save his own skin. He's mm -hmm. also suggested that uh, these transactions, as he's called them, are private, that they are simply, and I'm quoting the president here from his Twitter account, a simple private transaction. They wrongly call it a campaign contribution, which it was not. But in parentheses, the president goes on to say, but even if it was, it is only a civil case like Obama. <laughs> uh, experts, uh, uh, Paula, as you know, have weighed in on the comparison that President Trump is throwing out there to his supporters to, in an attempt to muddy the waters here. He's downplaying the campaign finance crimes of his former attorney, Michael Cohen, uh, by talking about the campaign campaign violations that occurred uh, during the Obama campaign in 2008, where the former president was uh, fined $375,000, I believe, um, for issues related to incorrect filings or missing dates. Just break that down for our viewers and help debunk that myth. Well, let's let's parse this out into two parts. The first the first thing is the president has accused Cohen of being a liar and someone who flipped on him uh, to save himself. Well, that's that's true actually. Uh, Cohen did flip on the president in an effort to get a lesser sentence. Cohen is an admitted liar. He has consistently had trouble being completely honest in the course of this investigation. But that doesn't mean there wasn't an underlying crime. Now let's get to the campaign contribution question. First of all, the president said that he had no knowledge of this payment, and then once he admitted to having knowledge of this payment, he denied directing the payment. Now they're denying, uh, they're not denying that there was a payment, now they're saying it wasn't a campaign contribution, it was a personal matter. They're trying to defend against allegations of campaign finance violations by saying, look, this is something he did that was personal, it was to protect his family, he would have done it anyway, because if they can make that argument, if they could persuade prosecutors or a judge that this was not done in an effort to impact the election or help him get elected, they may be able to get around these charges. Now, the comparison to, to the Obama campaign, that's quite a different matter. In that case, the Obama campaign failed to disclose the names of donors for, I think it was about $2 million uh, in donations. In that case, it was treated as a civil matter. They had to pay a fine, and now the president's attorneys are trying to um, make these hush money payments also perhaps seem like a civil, private, personal matter. But the fact is, Vlad, uh, the evidence that we have so far in this case is that it does appear that Cohen was an agent of the campaign, that he paid this money in an effort to help the president in the election. And that is why federal prosecutors say that the president may have committed campaign finance violations. Uh, yeah. And we uh, as Paula points out, um, experts uh, have weighed in on those comparisons between uh, the Obama violations um, and these crimes that were committed by Mr. Cohen. Uh, in fact, at one point, uh, for the 1988 presidential campaign, the Federal Elections Commission uh, audit triggered a $120,000 penalty for Republican Bob Dole's campaign strategy. That's because, and let's remember that the Obama campaign was a billion dollar campaign. It was one of the biggest campaigns up until that point. Um, I wonder though what the White House, I know that you said that the White House, Ouija, is not talking a lot about what is happening there in lower Manhattan, but what are they saying about how the president is going to treat all of these investigations and a looming threat of a Democrat takeover of Congress coming in January with subpoena power. What is the strategy? Has there been a war room? What are they telling you about what they expect to do to face some of those challenges that are upcoming? Well, certainly behind closed doors, they are preparing. They know that when the new year uh, kicks in, that the Democrats that will now control the House will not be shy uh, to launch these probes into uh, those campaign finance violations, into the Russia uh, potential collusion and obstruction. Um, but, you know, publicly, it 
President Trump himself is very defiant, and we have seen that time and time again. And he he says he's really oh, stand not by, worried. Stand by, we just stand by oh, just sure. for just one moment. I know Paul is out there now, and I just think I caught a glimpse of Mr. Cohen's family uh, coming out of those doors. Um, uh, down in lower Manhattan. And I also note that uh, we are hearing that Mr. Cohen uh, will be remanded to the authorities on March 6th. That is when he will begin serving uh, his sentence. I, I thought we were going to catch a glimpse of him there. As you can imagine, there's going to be pandemonium and chaos as you see all those reporters, including I think that's our Paula Reed right there trying to get a shot uh, and maybe even a comment from Mr. Cohen before he's spirited away in that vehicle. We're going to keep an eye on, on that. We uh, I don't hear any sound. So let's keep let's keep talking. You, you were talking about um, what the president and his team are going to do to prepare for what will be a very tumultuous couple of years with the Democrats in control of the House, and yet, Ouija, we know that he's soon going to be without a chief of staff. That's right. And, you know, just yesterday we saw a, a wild confrontation play out in the Oval Office, perhaps by design. Uh, it diverted attention away from the frantic search for a chief of staff, um, away from the potential legal troubles that he faces that, that he knew we would be talking about today. And it's important that you bring that up, Vlad, because part of the reason why it is difficult to find somebody to replace Kelly is because of the political environment that we are seeing unfold right mm. now as just one example in New York City, because whoever takes the job um, no, All right, stand the by, Weijer. Stand by. Here comes Short. Michael Here Cohen. We go. Let's see if we can get a shot. Well, you can see there that uh, if that's the car that is that Mr. Cohen is in. That was very quick. <laughs> Did not pause at all before he got into that vehicle. Although there are microphones that are set up there outside of the courthouse, which we believe the prosecution is going to be stepping to in just moments to make some comments about what has just happened. Again, if you're just joining us here at the half hour mark or so uh, on CBS News, CBSN, uh, we are covering the news out of lower Manhattan that the president's former attorney and fixer, the man who once said that he would take a bullet for President Trump, he has just been sentenced to three years um, in prison. Uh, and so we just stand by just one moment. Uh, Paula Reed, you're there. Uh, I'm guessing you caught a glimpse of Mr. Cohen as he was spirited away in that vehicle. Did he say anything? He did not. He did not address reporters as he got into a car with his family and sped off. His attorney uh, just walked past us. We lobbed some questions at him. He also declined to comment, although he did give an impassioned statement on behalf of his client at the beginning of the sentencing hearing. He described him as a good man, a reformed man, and he tried to plead with the judge to give him a minimal sentence. But obviously, with this three-year sentence, he was not fully successful. All right, stand by, Paula. Here's Michael Avenatti. He is the lawyer for porn star Stormy Dan to the conduct of Donald Trump. Let me be clear. Michael Cohen is neither a hero nor a patriot. He lied for months on end about his criminal conduct and the role of the President of the United States. He lied in March. He lied in April. He lied in May. He lied in June. He lied in July. And only until his back was against the wall and he faced significant prison time did he decide to, quote, come clean. He even lied to the office of the special counsel in July of this year. Michael Cohen is no hero. He is no patriot. His choice time and time again was to degrade my client, seek to intimidate her, call her and me liars, and seek to degrade the office of the presidency of the United States by seeking to buy effectively an election. This is an outrage. He deserves every day of the 36-month sentence that he will serve. And I will also note with great irony, Michael Cohen will report to federal prison exactly one year after we filed the case on behalf of Stormy Daniels. Michael Cohen was sentenced today. Donald Trump is next. Thank you. 
All right, there you just heard from Michael Avenatti. He is the lawyer who was representing uh, porn star Stormy Daniels um, in all this. She is one of the women that Mr. Cohen paid uh, off uh, in an attempt, what prosecutors say, to effectively influence the outcome of the election. At one point, prosecutors saying, as you just heard uh, Michael Avenatti say, that uh, Mr. Cohen undermined democracy. I think we still have Paula Reed with us, and Ouija Jang is standing by. No, Paula. Okay, so Ouija is standing by at the White House to talk about some of this. Um, it's interesting, Ouija, the, the president um, has called Michael Avenatti a liar. He has called Michael Cohen now a liar. He's called him a liar on Twitter. Um, but as you pointed out, and Michael Avenatti just pointed out, uh, that the president also did not tell the truth when he was asked about those two women. Right. We have it on camera. We've played it many a times aboard Air Force One when he was initially asked about the payments and whether he knew about the payments. And he very bluntly said no. And even though it was an easy answer, it was a definitive answer that he gave very quickly. And that answer has evolved, which is why it is important uh, to make note of that as prosecutors, again, try to get closer and closer, perhaps, to charging someone else in this matter that has been implicated in their court filings, again, as individual one, linked to Michael Cohen and those hushed money payments. And that's why it's so important to understand the timeline of how the evolution of truth played out here. Um, but it, it is important that you point out who President Trump calls a liar, Vlad, because um, we were just noting earlier that, um, you know, when somebody decides to cooperate with prosecutors or with a special counsel, immediately President Trump calls them weak, calls them a liar, says that they are out just to save their own skin. And when you look at the treatment of Michael Cohen uh, by President Trump versus Paul Manafort, his former campaign chairman, it could not be more different. And perhaps the president continues to use the Manafort case as an example of what people ought to do when they face uh, potential charges that could damage the president. Um, as recently as last week, the president says he has not taken taken a presidential pardon off the table for Manafort, who did strike a plea deal with special counsel Mueller, but uh, Mueller said he ended up violating that deal. And so we know that loyalty is so important to President Trump. It's something that he'll always be talking about and why today was so important to see what happens when that loyalty dissipates. Uh, and in this case, Michael Cohen, who once said, as you rightfully mentioned so many times, that at one point he said he would take a bullet for President Trump. Trump. And that brings us back to, as we were talking about, the search for the chief of staff, because obviously President Trump is looking for someone who has that loyalty, who will work with him in every capacity to carry out his wishes and his agenda. And it's hard to find that person because we've seen that that loyalty does not always go two ways. And so even though the president is looking for someone who will have his back, uh, you know, in this case, we see how quickly the president could turn on someone who supported him um, so aggressively, so loudly for so long. Um, and so, Vlad, that's where we are here. We're waiting for the president to make some sort of comment about Cohen while we wait to see what happens in his scramble to find somebody to lead uh, his staff, a chief of staff to replace Kelly, who is supposed to leave at the end of the year. It's a tough position to fill right now. Indeed. Um, we just stand by uh, because uh, we want to bring in criminal defense attorney Jay Apt. He's on the phone with us now. Paula Reed is also standing by to talk us through some of this. Um, so, Jay, we understand that Mr. Cohen will surrender to the authorities on March 6th. Um, what kind of a prison is he expected to go to? What kind of... Just take us through that day. Yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, generally, the prison is decided by a federal agency, the Board of Prisons, and they will do a uh, or they've already done uh, um, a pre-sentence uh, investigation report and evaluation of Mr. Cohn. In all likelihood, he'll go to a minimum security facility that is reserved for white-collar criminal defendants. There's one in Montgomery, Alabama, um, and it's it's still it's still prison. Make no mistake. There are bars, there are walls, there is barbed wire, but it's a lot nicer than um, you know a level four, level five. Uh, type prison in the federal system where you're on lockdown 23 hours a day and 
you're in a supermax facility and you don't see sunlight. Um, he'll be outside some of the time. Uh, there'll be, you know, uh, activities, so to speak, and the food won't be as bad. Um, <laughs> but it's still prison. He's yeah. still locked up. I will say, you know, 36 months is on the, I think, the lighter side of the sentencing guidelines um, for what the judge could have done. And I think that's because of his cooperation. We call that a, a 5K motion in federal court where the prosecutors, along with the defense attorney, argue for a lighter sentence based on his cooperation with, uh, with um, previous you know, uh, information that he's given and then ongoing, ongoing cooperation that he will get. Uh, uh, Paula Reed, you're standing by as well. Uh, let me ask you to put your lawyer hat in addition to your reporter hat. What's your take on this? Well, in this case, he actually didn't get a 5K letter. Federal prosecutors were not particularly pleased with his cooperation. While the special counsel investigators said that he provided credible information to them, federal prosecutors here in New York says they do not believe that Cohen fully cooperated. They don't believe that he shared everything he knows about potential crimes that were committed. And that's part of why they did not advocate for leniency. That's part of why he did not get a recommendation or a letter from them seeking leniency. And I think that's also why you're seeing this sentence of about 30 six months. That's just a little bit less than what the probation department recommended. They re recommended about three and a half years. So overall, it appears that the judge did sort of defer to federal prosecutors and their assessment of his cooperation was they weren't very impressed. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Paula, too. I mean, you, you raise a good point, and maybe our viewers will um, want to understand that distinction in a bit of a finer point, which is uh, that there are two separate investigations that are happening, and you had the Southern District mm -hmm. um, with one version of what they thought should happen to Mr. Cohen, and then you had Robert Mueller and the special counsel. The uh, Southern District wrote to the judge that Mr. Cohen had, and I'm going to quote them here, had a rose-colored view of the seriousness of his crimes, which they said were marked by a pattern of deception that permeated his professional life. Much of what we heard about that is similar to what Michael Avenatti just said, and if there's one thing that Michael Avenatti and the president both agree on, it is that Michael Cohen is a liar. <laughs> Yes, uh, Mr. Avenatti, who is tangentially involved with this case, of course, he represents Stormy Daniels, who is at the, at the heart of those campaign contribution violations. But um, Mr. Avenatti doesn't really have any formal role in this case. He did not take questions from reporters. And yesterday, he suffered a significant blow when his client, Stormy Daniels, was ordered to reimburse the president for uh, legal fees. Now, I asked him uh, whether or not the president's going to get his money. He ignored uh, my question. But getting back to your original point, yes, there are two separate cases that Cohen is participating in. One is the special counsel investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 campaign. He cooperated with them. They believe he provided useful, credible information. But there's a separate investigation here with federal prosecutors in New York into possible campaign finance violations. That has nothing to do with Russia. That's why it's being handled by federal prosecutors and not the special counsel. But those federal prosecutors, they say while Cohen provided some information that he was not fully cooperative and cooperation in the context of a plea deal it, it's an all or nothing prospect and they were not very impressed with the extent of his cooperation which is why they were not advocating for leniency and they told the judge they believe he deserves a substantial sentence but special counsel Robert Mueller did support imprisonment but did not weigh in in terms of how long the sentence should be mm. um, we just final thoughts from you uh, we I, I think I noticed something earlier this morning the president does have some kind of a public event uh, later today, or perhaps it's already happened. Uh, but uh, as we look ahead to uh, the next couple of hours, the next couple of days, um, what do we expect we will see or hear from the White House? Are we expecting any announcement, for example, on the government shutdown? Are we expecting? Because I know that you know th there's there are some who will wait for the the, op the the president will take this opportunity to weigh in on Twitter about some of the developments. But uh, he's got to be very judicious these days um, with those kinds of tweets. And he hasn't been as active as he had been in the past. So I'm wondering um, if there's any kind of movement we expect from the president today or the next couple of days and uh, how we see this sort of playing out from, uh, from where we are now. 
Well, he hasn't been as active, but he also has not stopped altogether, certainly in weighing in on these cases that involve him. But there is a lot of work to be done, and we are expecting some sort of movement, some sort of indication about how he plans to avoid a government shutdown if he does, because just yesterday we heard him uh, own up to it and say that he doesn't mind having his name attached to a shutdown if that means that he's fighting for his border wall. Uh, we know that he is continuously looking for a chief of staff, even though he says there are about 10 or 12 people who are vying for the job and who want the job. Uh, so far, the White House has not said there are any real front runners because they had to start from scratch after his first choice fell apart. And they are preparing for the new year when Democrats take over and they know that there are potential investigations having to do with both of these uh, probes that could unfold on Capitol Hill. And so there's a lot to be done here that does not have to do with uh, whatever then candidate Trump may or may not have done criminally. And that's something huge that he has to address also. Um, and we're waiting to see how he does that. So far, we haven't seen a glimpse of him here at the White House. Uh, we don't know if he has actually gone into work or if he remains in his residence, perhaps watching all of this unfold on television, as he so often does. Um, and so that is what we are, are hoping to get some answers about uh, where his mind is right now mm. as he watches his former fixer and personal attorney that he was so close to be sentenced to three years behind bars for crimes that he may be linked to. And of course, uh, there isn't a White House press briefing on the horizon. I can't, I lost track of how many, when was the last <laughs> time we had one, Ouija. So uh, I'm guessing we're not going to hear much from uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Uh, Ouija and Jang. And you'd be right. Yeah. <laughs> Ouija <laughs> Jang standing by for us at the White House. Ouija, thank you so much. We'll look for your reporting a little bit later. Paula Reed, you are still there um, at the courthouse in Lower Manhattan. Um, you know, here's a question, and Paula, and I just popped into my head. Um, is there anything? <laughs> that prevents Mr. Cohen from talking about what he knows or what he knew or what the president told him to do or didn't tell him to do um, to the press, to members of the public, um, and could potentially Congress, given that we're seeing, we're going to see a, a handover uh, to the Democrats in January, could Congress potentially call him up before them to talk about what he knows? Uh, eventually, although, of course, one of the things he pleaded guilty to was lying to Congress. So, again, not the <laughs> right. most credible witness. Yeah, not be, won't but be credible. a short time ago, one of, <laughs> uh, one of his attorneys, Lanny Davis, issued a statement saying at the appropriate time, he looks forward to helping his client share more of his story and more about what he knows. But, Vlad, the one thing that we know and that has become abundantly clear over the last week is that the special counsel investigation, the president's legal problems, none of this is wrapping up anytime soon. We know that because Cohen will continue to cooperate. He has also provided evidence, the closest link directly linking the president to criminal conduct. He shared that with a special counsel on, and federal prosecutors uh, that was disclosed on on Friday. Also, Paul Manafort, he won't be sentenced until February and March. We know the grand jury continues to hear from new witnesses. We expect new indictments. So even though the president's attorneys have been arguing for months that all of this is wrapping up, the fact is, Vlad, this is not wrapping up anytime soon. In fact, it just continues to expand and become more complicated and perilous for the president, not only legally, but also politically, because a sitting president cannot be indicted. That is the opinion of the current Justice Department. So any evidence of criminal wrongdoing by the president could potentially go to Congress for possible impeachment. Uh, we are indeed in uncharted waters. Uh, Paula Reed, thank you so much. You've been there all morning long for us. We so appreciate it, as always. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Weijia Jang at the White House, we appreciate uh, your input and your reporting as well. And criminal defense attorney Jay Apter. Jay, are you still with us? I am. I am. So just your final thoughts on what we just was. I mean, you know, that we are in uncharted territory here. Uh, it, it is very unusual. I didn't mean to suggest earlier that the government had given Mr. Cohn a 5K. I was trying to explain what a 5K was, and 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 the report is correct. He, he was actually not given a 5K in this case. However, I do think the judge went um, below what was recommended because of his substantial cooperation. And it is very uncharted territory to have a criminal co-conspirator be the president of the United States. It's it's beyond the 
it's beyond anything we've ever seen. Yeah, no one's ever seen anything like this, um, especially somebody who's just been sentenced like this to three years in prison. And, you know, people will draw uh, comparisons to Watergate. I think we are getting, at least now, we're moving away from those comparisons because there's still a lot more that we don't know. One last question I do have for you, Jay, is uh, I, I look at the pictures of Michael Cohen there and I think about how far that we've come. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that Mr. Cohen is somebody who sort of roll the dice. And um, as has been pointed out by both of our reporters, uh, he's a proven liar and now he's a convicted liar. The question I have, though, is because of his sentencing, does that indicate to you that both the Southern District and Robert Mueller are basically done with him? He's given them everything that he possibly could give them or is as part of his deal that he will continue, have to continue singing to them whenever they need him to? Yeah, I, I don't think that I think the Southern District is done with him. OK, I don't think that's the case with Mueller, though. I think Mueller is going to rely on him in their report. And the the what I think is going to be fascinating to watch from a legal perspective is if you're Donald Trump and if I'm a federal let me let me restate that if I'm a federal prosecutor right now, whether I'm on Mueller's team or the Southern District or working in the Department of Justice, I'm waiting to see what happens in 2020, because if Donald Trump is not elected, then he's no longer the president, and then he can be indicted and imprisoned based upon the testimony that Michael Cohn could give in the future. And he, Michael Cohn could be called to testify based upon his, his plea that he's now given um, and give consistent testimony with what he's told Mueller's team um, that would imprison at some point. Uh, potentially in prison, Donald Trump. Jay, App, thank you so much for joining us and providing some of that clarity. We so appreciate it. Uh, if you are just joining us at the bottom of the hour here, the news out of the lower Manhattan here in New York City. Former Trump attorney Michael Cohen has just been sentenced to three years in federal prison. This followed uh, followed by three years of supervised release. Uh, uh, this happened during a sentencing hearing in federal court in which Mr. Cohen claimed he acted out of blind loyalty to President Trump. That is the news. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back.